Thank you, Jim, very much. It's, um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I've been with Pharmacanus for about a year now, and it is very humbling every day, uh, working with patients, doing what I do. Uh, you know, we're out educating physicians, we're out talking to patients, we're helping people sign up for their cards. Um, but the number one thing that I've seen, um, and I think Dr. Joshi said it perfect, um, there's not a cure. It's all about having another management tool. So really, I mean, having this management tool in people's toolboxes, I have seen some amazing and phenomenal results. Um, you know, different types of conditions, but specifically pain. Um, so just a little bit more about Pharmacanus. So we're the largest medical cannabis provider here in Illinois. Um, so we have four different dispensaries. We have two cultivation centers. Um, our dispensaries are located in Evanston, Ottawa, North Aurora and Schomburg. Um, we also cultivate, so we grow the product as well as dispense it. Um, we have the markets in New York, and upon Jim's point, we are diligently working to get cannabis in many different states, just because therapeutically and palliatively, it is so beneficial for patients. Um, humbled every day seeing the results that people are going through. Um, so just a little bit more about me. I was actually 360 pounds at my heaviest. Um, I was very fortunate. I lost 160 pounds, proper diet and exercise. Uh, I learned to be obese from my father. So my father was 400 plus pounds. He had his first heart attack at 40, his second one at 45, and his third and final one at 52. Um, I watched him suffer. Um, is anybody familiar with watching people suffer in this room? No. Right? So I watched my dad suffer and I was very fortunate um, because I saw what he did and I decided that I did not want that for my life. So I made a change to Gracie's point, what she was talking about. I changed my diet. I started managing my stress. Very fortunately, I was able to lose 160 pounds in about a year and a half. Um, the basis of today's talk, treating the whole person, optimizing through more holistic approaches, very, it, it hits home very hard with me because when I talk about the story, and I don't usually tell this that much when I talk in lectures um, in a format like this, but I lost the 160 pounds and I was more miserable than I was than, than when I was, ha than I was heavy. Um, what I learned is that it's a mind, body, spirit approach. Really, it's about treating the whole person. And I, my success was not losing the 160 pounds, but been keeping it off for 15 years. Um, so I was very fortunate. I had a sex successful career in healthcare. Um, I helped thousands of people create their wellness success stories. Um, very interesting, about, I'd say about three years ago, I started getting some pretty bad stomach pains. Um, is anybody familiar with pain in the room? Right, all the hands should go up over here. But I got some pretty bad stomach pains and I, you know, it got to the point where it was affecting my life, it was affecting my quality of life. Um, so I went to the doctors. Um, immediately the doctors heard pain and what do you think they prescribed? Drugs. Opiates, opiates. So I followed their recommendations. I followed an opiate regimen for about a year. Um, after a year, I got, uh, you know, I stepped back and I realized that, okay, my stomach is 10 times worse and now I have this opiate addiction to deal with. Um, so I was very fortunate again, created my wellness success story again, got myself off the opiates, but my stomach continuously got worse. It got to the point where in the middle of 2015, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't work. I was the sickest that I've ever been in my life. I was the most scared that I've ever been in my life. Um, and they diagnosed me with Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease, it's an autoimmune condition. Um, it's one of the conditions that qualify for medical cannabis here in Illinois. So initially my physicians told me that I would be on infusions for the rest of my life. They said to manage my, my disease, the disease that's incurable, to manage this, you're gonna have to go to a clinic once a month for the rest of your life. You're gonna have to get this infusion forever. No matter who you're with, you could be on vacation, you have to find one of these clinics. Um, I decided that wasn't the route that I, had, that I wanted to go. I knew that my disease was not curable, but I knew that my disease was manageable. And I knew that there was many different management tools out there, one of them being cannabis. So I decided to become a cannabis patient. I use cannabis every single day of my life in various forms, and knock on wood, I am medication free. I am managing my symptoms. I was just back to my physicians um, about two months ago and they are blown away. They don't understand how not following the biologic regimen that they gave me, that I went from being as sick as I was, as scared as I was, to walking back into their office. So this is just one story. My story is just one story. There's thousands of people that we've seen and my colleagues have seen over the last year that have these success stories. 
right? They're getting out of pain. They're getting out of the opiates. I mean, I would be up here all day talking about the people that have went from 10 Vicodins and four Oxycontins to just using cannabis for their pain regimens. So, you know, to Dr. Joshi's point, and I want to hammer this home, is that this is not a curable thing. Crohn's disease is not curable. CRPS is not curable. It's manageable. And cannabis is an option that you have out there. Um, so how many people know that cannabis is legal here in Illinois? Good show of hands. Good show of hands. So today, and uh, let's go, there we go. So let's just pop up this agenda. So I have four key points that I want to talk about today. First one's going to be the history of cannabis. The second one, the science, um, administration methods, and then the Illinois program. So really, the goal today is to educate people in the room about medical cannabis, having it be a management tool for you, but more importantly, to be able to educate you for friends and family. Right? So we all, if we took a minute to write down who we know that's suffering, who we know that can benefit from another treatment option, I bet we would have just lists and lists of names. Um, so definitely that's the goal of today, is educating not just for you, but to spread the word to different people. All right, so the history of cannabis. So if we look at cannabis, cannabis has been around for thousands of years. Um, it was first um, recognized back in Central Asia about 5,000 years ago. Um, it's interesting how it's migrated with us as humans as we've migrated across the globe. Um, you know, if you look at the history, they found it buried with Egyptian tombs um, with the pharaohs that were buried. Um, you know, it was used um, for menstrual cramps. Queen Elizabeth used it in the late 1500s, early 1600s for menstrual cramps. Um, it was first brought to the U.S. in 1575 by the Spanish, and then again in 1612 by the English. Um, very interesting. It was used for many different things. It was used for food. It was used for fuel. It was used for textiles. But more importantly, it was used for medicine. Um, so what you see here is a couple different medications that were coming out of pharmacies back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so cannabis, you know, was readily prescribed. It was in our U.S. Ph pharmacopoeia in 1850. There were over 28 different versions of cannabis that were coming out of different, different pharmacies back, back in the early 1900s. Um, very interesting. If you fast forward to about the 1920s, um, a big propaganda campaign was put together. Is anybody familiar with Reefer Madness? Has anybody ever heard this movie? So if you watch it nowadays, it's a little bit of a comedy, but just take a minute and put yourself back in the 1920s and just imagine watching this type of movie. It demonized cannabis. It put a negative connotation on it. Um, you know, from years prior, you know, this medication coming out of different pharmacies used for thousands of years, it really demonized how people viewed cannabis. And really, that was the etiology or the start of the stigmas that a lot of us and my colleagues and I are trying to break nowadays with medical cannabis. Um, so they put together this propaganda campaign. A lot of people say it was because the immigrants were coming across the border and they wanted to give them a negative connotation because marijuana was part of their culture. Um, a lot of people said it was because prohibition ended and Henry Anslinger and the guys that just worked on the prohibition, the alcohol prohibition, they needed something else to consume their time. Um, you know, whatever the reason was behind it, what it led to was in 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act. So basically this act said that physicians can still prescribe cannabis but they had to pay a tax, they had to buy a stamp, and they had to put it on the bottle. So really, what this led to was the decline of cannabis as medicine. Um, it was opposed by the American Medical Association, but still, this is where the stigmas um, of what we think of as marijuana you know, originally started back in the 30s. All right, so fast forward into the 50s, into the 60s, into the 70s, uh, Richard Nixon was president, and what they did was they put together different schedules of substances. Has anybody ever heard of the, you know, the Schedule Ones, the Schedule Twos, the drugs, the classifications? So if you look at Schedule One, um, the criteria for this category was highly addictive and no medicinal benefit. Um, so we see marijuana is falling in that Schedule One classification, which is an issue because when something is a Schedule One, it's a little bit different and there's a lot different things that you have to do to study it. Um, you know, Dr. Joshi was saying about the ketamine, you know, you know, it's something that's a new treatment, you know, everybody's getting together, they're trying to figure out, I mean, that's with cannabis too, because it's a Schedule One, um, we haven't been able to study it the way that we could. Um, just looking at the things that we have up here, so marijuana, it's in the Schedule One, they say it's highly addictive. Um, a marijuana has the same addiction rate as caffeine, about 9%. If you look at the other things in that category, heroin, LSD, you're looking at anywhere from 17 to 29% addiction rates. Um, so looking at these schedules nowadays, we know that marijuana doesn't fit. 
Um, there's chatters about getting it rescheduled, and the importance of that is so that we could really have the research and the data that we need to move this forward and to really get some good um, you know, decisions as far as treatment protocols moving forward. Um, we go to Schedule 2. That's where we see a lot of the opiates. Um, very interesting fact, um, 44 people a day die from opiate overdoses. 44 people a day. And pain, I mean, that's the number one thing that you know, a lot of us are talking about here, trying to manage pain. Um, interesting to statistic, um, the University of Mississippi in 2014, they did a study, and they found that states with medical marijuana programs have a 25% less fatality rate. Right? So those 44 people a day that we're talking about, 25% less in states that have medical cannabis programs. Um, so the way that it stands right now, it's still a Schedule 1, um, but you know, the importance is to try to move that to a different schedule for research purposes. Um, if we look at two substances that weren't even scheduled when they put together these, we have tobacco and alcohol. So tobacco kills about half a million people a year. Um, alcohol, about 125,000, and that's just people that are drinking too much. It's not people that are drinking, getting behind a wheel and driving. Um, so does anybody know how many people marijuana kills each year? Zero, right? Zero. It's a safe profile, and there's a science behind why marijuana um, you know, is, is such is something safe and a safe substance to be using. Um, so definitely, you know, looking at the history of it, looking at the schedules, we know that marijuana has medicinal benefit. We know moving forward that, um, you know, there's something to it for us to look at. And then just to validate those statistics, so if you go on the CDC website, you'll see 44 people a day dying from opiate overdoses. Um, also on the DEA website, we have that no reports have ever been reported um, for deaths or overdoses with cannabis. All right, and really, you know, to sum up the history of cannabis, yeah, we have this long 5,000 year history, but really what I challenge people to do is think about your own personal history with cannabis. Um, you know, a lot of us don't know cannabis any different from being something that's recreational, being something that people are using to alter their mind. I mean, really, I mean, to hit home, um, the most important thing is to, is to redefine your history with cannabis, knowing that there's medicinal benefit from what we're gonna talk about today. All right, so very interesting, the science. Um, in 1960, Dr. Machulam in Israel discovered two different cannabinoids. It was THC and CBD. So THC, Delta-9, tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, cannabidiol. So he was um, you know, from Israel, he was a researcher. He was fascinated by the fact that there were definite effects from cannabis, but nobody knew why. Right? So he would see people that would utilize cannabis, um, you know, it, it would alter them, you know, it alters who you are, it alters your perception a little bit, and he was just so enthralled as to why nobody knew what it was and how it, how it happened. Um, so he discovered THC. So with these two cannabinoids, you know, THC, it's very good for pain management, um, very good for muscle spasticity, it helps stimulate appetite, it helps with sleep. But a lot of the times, we get the psychedelic effect from it, or the high that we get from it. Um, on the flip side, you have a cannabinoid that's called CBD or cannabidiol. So has anybody heard stories about the little kids with seizures, right, that are taking this oil under their tongue, or their families are getting uprooted and they're going to Colorado? So that's the product that they're majority using, is the CBD or the cannabidiol. Um, you know, and I've heard Dr. Joshi, I heard Gracie touch on this, inflammation. Right, so the CBD is gonna be amazing cannabinoid for inflammation, it's gonna be really good for pain management, it's an anti-anxiety, so it's gonna help with relaxation, but more importantly, you do not get the psychedelic effects from the CBD. Um, so really with medical cannabis moving forward, knowing that with THC, there's something beyond the psychedelic effect. There's pain management effects, there's appetite stimulating effects, and with the CBD, with the anti-inflammatory effects, you can use your medication and you don't have to be impaired while you're doing it. So that was a pretty pivotal point in the science of cannabis in the 1960s where these discovered this too. Um, it was interesting, so from the 60s to the 90s, a lot of the research that was going on with cannabis was trying to prove the negative effects of it trying to prove the short-term psychosis, trying to prove the long-term schizophrenia. It wasn't until 1992 when they discovered something that was called the endocannabinoid system that all of these philosophies changed. So really, scientists discovered that there is a physiology, a system of receptors. Um, Dr. Joshi was talking about the MDMA receptors you know, for the ketamine. So with cannabis, you have this whole receptor system that works in conjunction with the THC and the CBD. So they call it your endocannabinoid system. 
You have CB1 receptors that are found mostly in the brain. You have CB2 receptors that are found mostly in the body. Um, to try to keep it simple and to not get too technical, the goal of your endocannabinoid system is to work as like a security guard or a referee with your nervous system and your immune system, right? And if we look at CRPS, there's a lot going on with your nervous system and there's a lot going on with your immune system. Um, so the goal of the endocannabinoid system is to establish homeostasis or balance with these two systems. Right? So when we have a nervous system that's out of balance, we have excitotoxicity, we have a lot of pain flares. Right? When we have an immune system that's out of balance, we see things like Crohn's disease. We see things like rheumatoid arthritis. So really, it works like a lock and key. You have these receptors, you ingest cannabis, the cannabis is going to fit into those receptors like a key fits into a lock. It's going to trigger a lot of biological and physiological responses that, to sum it up and keep it simple, is going to try to balance out your immune system and your nervous system. Um, even more interesting was that they discovered that we have things that are called endocannabinoids. So things that are called anandamide, things that are called 2-AG. So these are compounds that are synthesized on demand in our body during times of stress, during times of flares. So the fact that we have this internal system that works hand in hand physiologically with us, and it works the same way with external substances in cannabis, is pretty amazing. Really, that's what raised everybody's eyebrows to marijuana, not just being something recreational, not just being something that we're looking at the negative effects of, but what positively and what positive effects come out of this plant. Um, so in the 90s, that's really where the turning point was. In 1996, California started its first medical program. Um, and in 2001, the Institute of California also started something that was called um, the Institute of Cannabis Research. So you know, there's preliminary data, there's subjective data that we have from patients. Um, and all of this stems from the discovery of the endocannabinoid system in the early 90s. All right, so like we were talking about earlier, how many people die every year from cannabis? Zero. So the reason that we have this is because of the concentration of your CB1 receptors. So we have these CB1 receptors that are all over the brain, the highest concentration being in the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, but where you don't find these receptors is gonna be in the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is responsible for things such as respiration, such as breathing. If you look at the opioid receptor system, we have a very high concentration of opioid receptors in our spinal cord. So the one problem that that poses is that when people are taking too many opiates, what does that do to your breathing? It slows down your brain. It stops it. Respiratory depression, right? That's the first warning sign if you've ever seen anybody going into an opiate, opiate overdose is that their breathing is labored. Their breathing is, is slow. And that's because of the receptors and the high concentration. So cannabis, you do not have these receptors in the spinal cord, which is why it's such, you know, uh, it's such a high safety profile is because you cannot overdose with it. Um, you know, the concentration of the other receptors are going to sort of gear what type of response you're going to get from your cannabis. So like, for example, if you're ingesting cannabis and it's going to trigger those hypothalamus CB1 receptors, that's going to stimulate appetite. Right? If you're using the cannabis and you hit those receptors that are in the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, that's going to affect your movement. So really, I mean, there's a whole science behind this and we're just touching the ice of what we can learn and what we will be learning um, moving forward with this, with this as a medication. All right, so administrative methods. So there are so many different ways to administer your cannabis. I think the one um, you know, stigma that you know, my colleagues and I try to debunk is that medical cannabis patients are not smoking joints all day and they're not walking around high all day. Um, so definitely, you know, as patients, you have many different options as far as different ways to ingest your medication. Um, you know, a couple different options up here. I like to break it down into three different categories. So we have inhalation, we have ingestion, and then we have topicals. So just to hit on the topicals real quick, and I was just talking with a CRPS patient, um, it was about a week ago, and they called it liquid gold, right? That's what they referred to the topical. So the topicals are gonna be a lotion that's infused with the cannabinoids, the THC, the CBD that we talked about, that you apply local, locally and topically to a different area. So whether it's an elbow, whether it's your hands, whether it's your knees. Um, 
you know, that, that term sticks in my head is the liquid gold that patients call it just for the pain management properties that you get from it. Um, so along with the topicals, you have also something that's called inhalation. So generally when people think of cannabis, that's how they think of administering it is inhaling your cannabis. Um, the good thing about inhalation is that it's very fast acting. So for example, and how many of us experience pain on a daily basis? A lot of us, right? How many of us when we're in pain, we wanna get out of that pain like yesterday? All of us, right? So that's the good thing about inhalation is that it's very fast acting. Um, you know, within a matter of seconds to minutes, that's gonna act on the pain receptors um, and that's what's gonna give you relief. Um, a lot of people try to, you know, get away from the traditional, traditional combustion of cannabis, right? So generally we put cannabis in a paper and we roll it, we put it in a pipe and we burn it. Um, you know, anytime that you ignite something, anytime that you light something, carcinogens are generated. Um, so a lot of the times people go the route of vaporization. Um, has anybody heard that term vaporization before? So vaporization is basically when you heat the cannabis to a certain temperature, you're activating the cannabinoids, you're turning them to a vapor or a steam, and then that's how you inhale your cannabis. Um, so definitely not as harsh on the lungs, definitely not as pungent of a smell. Um, you know, if anybody's ever heard, you know, hey, what's that skunk over there, you know, is somebody burning cannabis, right? So you don't get that with the vaporizer. Um, but the most important thing is that it's very fast acting when you inhale your cannabis. Um, on the flip side of that, you have something that's called ingestion. Um, so the ways that you can ingest your cannabis would be through a method that was called a tincture. So you remember those pictures that we showed back in the 30s of the medications that physicians were using back in the late 1800s, early 1900s? A lot of that was tincture driven. So it's gonna be an oil that's infused with the cannabinoids that you administer sublingually or under the tongue. You would hold it there for about 30 to 60 seconds and then that's how you administer your medication. Um, so the tincture, um, it's not as fast acting as the inhalation, but it is a, you know, a very quick onset time, anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. So point being, as patients, you have autonomy and you have a say-so in your medication regimen. And that's the biggest thing that I see different with what we do in the medical cannabis industry versus what's going on in healthcare. My background was healthcare. I was in a clinic in a private practice with a family physician and all day long we would say to people, take 20 milligrams twice a day for the next 30 days and I'll see you then. Whereas with the cannabis, your input is extremely important, your preferences, your aversions, um, and developing an awareness of when you're using the medication is the most important thing. Um, so with the tincture, um, you put that under your tongue and that's gonna last anywhere from two to three hours, the same response time um, as the inhalation. But the thing is, if you don't want to inhale, you don't have to inhale. You know, we get a lot of patients that, you know, haven't smoked anything in their life and they don't want to start. You know, we get other patients that, you know, maybe were heavy smokers for many years and, you know, they don't want that trigger of just putting anything back into their lungs. So you have that option and you have that choice of something like a tincture. Um, you also have things like capsules, right? So it would be a capsule that you would just take normally the same way that you would like a multivitamin, same thing. Um, we also have products um, that are called edibles. So edibles are gonna be things like cookies, candies, gummies, things that are infused with the cannabinoids. Um, the good thing about the edibles is that they're gonna be very long lasting, right? So five to eight hours sometimes on these edibles. Um, a strategy that I see all the time with cannabis patients um, is using an edible prior to sleep, right? Because it has that five to eight hour time that it's gonna last and interact in your system. So taking something like that before bed is sometimes the only thing that's given people a full night's sleep in decades. Um, so really your goal with all of these administration methods um, is to develop an awareness of how they affect you um, and to figure out what your arsenal of products is gonna be. Because really we see that patients aren't just sticking with inhalation. They're not just sticking with ingestion. They're thinking what their lives are like, what their functionality has to be, what their preferences are, what their aversions are, and working together with somebody like myself or one of my colleagues, tailoring a regimen that's gonna be specific to you, that's not only gonna be efficacious for whatever you're looking to manage, but something that you're on board with and something that you're educated with. Um, so really, I mean, the thing to, to try to hit home with the administration methods is that there's far other options other than just inhaling your cannabis to get your medication in you. All right, so the overview of the program, and this might be one of the most important things to cover because cannabis is legal here in Illinois um, and it's an option. It's gonna be another management option for you, friends, family, loved ones that are suffering um, from you know, either CRPS or any of the conditions that we have for the program. 
So the first thing to think about um, when applying for your card are the qualifying conditions. So basically we have 41 different qualifying conditions, RSD, CRPS is on there. Um, a lot of them are neurological based, a lot of them are autoimmune based. Um, it's very interesting, as of August 1st, we saw the first expansion of the program and they added the conditions PTSD and they added terminal illness. So it's pretty amazing because the program had some barriers getting up and running. A lot of people were talking about the politics behind it, but we saw that first round of expansion, which is huge. Um, you know, we're hearing chatter of other conditions, post-op chronic pain, IBS, migraines. Um, but initially, the way that the program stands here in Illinois, you need to have one of these 41 qualifying conditions um, to get access to medical cannabis. Um, after having one of the qualifying conditions, the next thing is going to be the physician involvement. Um, so, and I like to hammer this home because a lot of people come to us and they say, my physician won't prescribe cannabis. They won't write me a script for cannabis. And we try to correct, letting you know that there are no prescriptions for cannabis. Really, the role of the physician is to certify that you have one of these qualifying conditions. So prior to August 1st, the program and the language behind it stated that a physician had to recommend that cannabis was beneficial for your qualifying condition, right? They had to say that you, had to get, that you got therapeutic and palliative benefit to it. Post August 1st, they changed that language where all a physician is doing is they're certifying that you have one of these conditions. So they're filling out your information. They're filling out their information. They're checking a box that says CRPS. They're checking a box that says Crohn's disease. And then what they do is they mail that to the Illinois Department of Public Health. So on the flip side, what you have as patients would be something that's called a patient application. I'm going to fast forward to here real quick. So patient application, there's many different steps. And I joke, um, you know, myself and our colleagues, so I have my, my colleague Isabel here today that's also a qualified patient along with me. Um, we go out in, in the state and, you know, we educate people, we help people with this, and we joke that we wish that we knew each other um, when we were applying for our cards. Because it's, it's a little bit of a, a tough process, and I hear some chuckles probably for some people that know the process, um, but there's a lot of steps that go into it. So the first thing is gonna be the application fee. So you have your choice of either a one-year card, a two-year card, or a three-year card. So the one-year card is gonna be 100, the two-year card is 200, the three-year card is gonna be 250. Um, so it's interesting because the Illinois Department of Public Health gives you the autonomy to make that choice. So a rule of thumb that I usually follow is that any opportunity I have to not deal with the state, I take that opportunity. So I have a three-year card. I have a three-year card myself. But there's other patients that maybe, you know, they're questioning whether there's efficacy with the treatment. Um, they're wondering whether this is going to be something that long-term they're going to benefit and get pain relief from. So the Illinois Department of Health has that option of having a one-year card in there. Um, it's interesting. So people that are on Social Security disability or supplemental security income or veterans get half-price rates. So for Social Security disability or a veteran, it's going to be $50 for a year, $100 for two years, $125 for three years. Is that Siri? Did Siri have a question? I thought I heard Siri have a question there. So on top of the application fee, um, you have to verify identity. So the way that you verify identity is going to be with a state ID, a driver's license, or a passport. They're going to ask that you submit a color copy of that. On top of your identity verification, they're going to ask you to verify residency. So they're going to ask you for two forms of residency verification. It could be something like a utility bill. It could be something like a bank statement. Um, on top of that, you get a two by two photo, and then you're going to have to get fingerprinted. So they call something, they call it a live scan fingerprint. Um, you would get the fingerprint done. You would compile all this and you send it to the Illinois Department of Public Health. So the way the program works, you have a qualifying condition. Your doctor certifies that you have a qualifying condition. You fill out the patient application. The Illinois Department of Public Health matches these two things up. And then about four weeks later, you get your cannabis card in the mail, and then you're able to access the dispensaries. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a complicated process, um, but we help as much as we can. Now, on top of the application, they also have a caregiver program. And I always encourage people, you know, don't think of caregiver as something that you need, you know, if, if you're depilitated or you can't, uh, you know, go to pick up your cannabis. Really, it's your opportunity to have an extra set of eyes, an extra set of ears when you're in the dispensary as well. So caregiver goes through the same process. Um, it's going to be a cheaper rate on the, on the application fee, and that's going to be somebody that can get into the dispensary with you or in place of you to purchase your medication.
All right, so to sum all that up, so the history of cannabis, cannabis has been around for 5,000 years. The little snapshot or the last 80 years of it being illegal and the stigmas that we have are just a small picture and the bigger picture of what this plant has done for, for many different things, for agriculture, for medicine. With the science of cannabis, there's a physiology and there's actually a receptor system that we know about that interacts with the THC and the CBD, which is why that we, you know, we're focusing on the medicinal benefit that we have of the plant. Administration methods. Cannabis patients are not walking around high all day. They have their choice to be using the CBD. They have other ways to administer their medication other than the traditional smoke of cannabis. And the overview of the program, it's a qualifying condition, it's a physician certifying that you have a condition, and then it's a patient application that you fill out. Um, so definitely, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. It's been amazing, and thank you, Jim, for having me here. Um, but, you know, this is just, uh, you know, another tool in the toolbox. Like Dr. Joshi said, these things are not curable, but they're manageable. And, right, and for people that have been through the gamut, they've been on 20 different medications, they've seen 10 different specialists and physicians, this is another option for people. And it's giving people hope. Most importantly, it's giving people hope and that other option at the end of the day. So thank you very much, everybody.